second part of our panel, uh, Disciplines and Organization of Studies. Uh, our first speaker is uh, of the second part uh, is Simone Dinder, who is a PhD candidate at Brandeis University and a lecturer in American Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on the role of public intellectuals in American society after the First World War until the end of the 1960s. The title of the paper, which I find difficult to pronounce, I have to say, is The Social Sciences and Cultural Citizenship, a new role for American universities between 1918 and 1968. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that, was the hardest, that was the hardest part. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, second to last uh, presentation of today. It's, it's been a, a long day already, but um, I'm very happy to be here. I've learned a lot from the presentation so far, and it's very good to see that um, even though we talk about different countries with different national histories, there are a lot of things that the histories of the university have in common. Um, so uh, I'm very happy about that. Um, I'll start uh, with my paper. In the 1960s, American academics identified a new landscape in the United States of mountain ranges or plateaus of higher education. Particularly on the east and the west coast of the United States, they saw conglomerations of university campuses surrounded by the industries and towns to which they provided an essential service. A spokesman for American academia, the University of California President Clark Kerr, labeled these units the Ideopolis, or the city of, Intell city of intellect. The research university had become instrumental to the United States, Kerr said, because modern society could not grow or persist without the development of new specialized knowledge. The instrumentality of the university to society was relatively new. Kerr and his contemporaries argued that American higher education was undergoing a, quote, great transformation. In his 1963 series of speeches on the uses of the university, Kerr argued that, quote, so many of the hopes and fears of the American people are now related to our educational system and particularly to our universities, that the university has become a prime instrument of national purpose. This is new. This is the essence of the transformation now engulfing our universities." End quote. And that was in 1963. In more modest terms, historians of American higher education have echoed Kerr's remarks that the university became more prominent in American society from the war years through the 1960s. They have mostly discussed the services that university prof universities provided to the war and Cold War administrators, labeling them Cold War universities. However, I would like to highlight the ways in which academics affected political culture and discourse as much as, and perhaps more than, official policymaking. American academia redefined its position in society around the middle of the 20th century. Responding to high numbers of entering students, the question of individual freedom in the world's leading democracy, and the threat of all-out atomic war, a number of influential university presidents suggested that the university become more than ever integrated in and instrumental to American society. Whether they spoke about applied sciences or community projects or general education for a more informed citizenry, administrators at top universities like Columbia, Harvard, MIT, all strove for a similar level of interaction with American civil society. And their calls were precursors of Kerr's instrumental university ideal in 1963. Uh, Kerr explained in uh, the uses of the university that social change had forced the university to come out of its traditional position of isolation. 
He referred to the growth and diversification of the student population due to the GI Bill, among others, which offered free education to all World War II veterans, and due to the, the baby boom. Uh, both of them brought in previously unimagined numbers of students. In addition, the past two world wars and the current Cold War, permeating all of society, had created expanding claims of national service. The result was a great demand of and funding for both the natural and the applied social sciences. And finally, the increasingly complicated needs of American commerce and production in the knowledge economy encouraged scholars to merge their activities with industry as never before. Universities therefore became involved in more families' lives, in increasingly specific commercial exchanges, and in the decision-making processes of government. In addition to these external factors, Kerr also brought up an intrinsic development in academia, and he called it new intellectual currents. When looking at the changing university, I would like to emphasize this internal drive for change more than Kerr did. In my point of view, the transformation of the university started with intellectual trends, or specifically with debates on the purpose of American higher education. These trends were encouraged by philanthropic organizations and university administrators with the intent of improving society. And subsequently, these streams of thought were propelled into real institutional changes faster than anticipated due to the urgency of wars and demographic, demographic shifts. Therefore, I think that the pressure of social change was not the sole cause of the university's transformation. Rather, it served as a medium through which internal developments could materialize quickly and visibly in the years following World War II. Therefore, we could discern a continuity in thinking about the role of the university rather than a radical break with World War II and the early Cold War. From the 1920s through World War II and the early Cold War, American intellectuals debated the position universities should hold in society. Following pragmatists like philosopher John Dewey, some of them emphasized the task of strengthening democracy by disseminating knowledge among the polity. They argued that the traditional view of academia had treated the university too much as a researcher and engineer in society and not enough as an educator. For prominent humanities scholars like Mortimer Adler and administrators of leading in, uh, universities such as James Bryant Conant of Harvard and Robert Hutchins of the University of Chicago, general education was the solution to many social ills. They argued that in addition to necessary technical skills, students and their families should remain exposed to the humanities in order to develop their characters and value, ju value judgment. Higher education should, just, should thus change its purpose, abandon the ivory tower for a place in the center of society, and put general education in the place of hyper-specialization. Education was to nurture the virtuousness of citizens and increase the quality of the informed citizenry. To Hutchins, who is in the middle uh, on, this, on the slide, good education involved reading great works of literature, and developing a certain kind of cultured sensibility to get along in society. Conant emphasized the scientific attitude every citizen should have. His arguments gained considerable backing during World War II, when scholars, as well as the general public, tried to define what made a democratic society strong in opposition to the totalitarian axis. Not only Conant, but a range of influential scholars, such as administrator Mark May at Yale, sociologist Robert Merton at Columbia, and the renowned public intellectual Margaret Mead, claimed that a scientific attitude was essential to good citizenship. Science, always open to debate, always leaving room for the possibility of an alternative explanation, was the foundation of democratic society. 
citizens should take on the scientific attitude in order to beat the axis as well as future totalitarian states or totalitarianism within the United States. The survival of democracy in precarious times was a motive for scholars to treat outside the ivory tower. They gave lectures to general audiences, they wrote popular scholarly books to be published in mass market paperbacks, and they contributed to social and political debates in the media. In the papers of administrators and scholars of major universities in the late 1930s, I found a striking number of invitations, lectures, and publications dealing with the theme of democracy and science. Their rationale was that democracy was among the highest purposes of education. In particular, publishers and scholars were interested in strengthening American intergroup solidarity across lines of class, race, and region. Activists and outward-looking academics included physicists, philosophers, and psychologists alike. Some of them became famous for their knowledge and guidance, and they became influential expert authorities. They presented their views on citizenship and peaceful cohabitation of diverse groups in lecture series sponsored by the pharmacist Charles Walgreen, called the Walgreen Lectures on American Institutions, or the Jewish, Theological Society, the Jewish Theological Seminary, or local Rotary Clubs. They were everywhere. Here, academics mingled with the people in public lecture series accessible to wider audiences, where they spoke about their work in relation to current events. These meetings were about de democracy as much as they were democratic in form. In the wake of World War II, the internal debate about education and democracy had therefore become a public debate, and intellectuals were more visible in society than ever. They consciously and successfully participated in and contributed to American political culture. The ideal of the university's contribution to democracy and social progress was not just translated in formal and informal education, but also in the university's research projects. Characteristic is the advocacy of engaged social scientific research by Dwight D. Eisenhower, who we see here on the picture as a president of Columbia University. Eisenhower's short university presidency from 1948 to 1953 has been dismissed in the historical narrative because the general and later uh, presidential candidate was often absent and he was kind of an outsider in higher ed education to begin with. Yet in the years that he led Columbia, Eisenhower embodied the spirit of the wartime activism that governed many other large American campuses. In his policy statements, I found that the contemporary ideals of education for citizenship and science for democracy came together. From his first day in office, Eisenhower called, called the cause of good citizenship a Columbia objective. In Columbia's handbook of 1948, he told students that, quote, democracy must defend itself by the virtues of its own institutions, for no armed forces of any kind can ever protect it long, end quote. With institutions, Eisenhower did not necessarily mean political institutions or legislation, but rather the building stones of society like labor, nutrition, education, and business. Focusing on these sectors, he believed, would, quote, serve best the needs of community and nation, end quote. Under Eisenhower's administration, civic education became a central focus at the Teachers College of Columbia University, and the business department began studying human resource man management. The activities of Columbia's Bureau of Social Science Research, monitoring social problems in the New York community, expanded greatly because Eisenhower was able to attract new sponsors. Not only in New York, but also in Detroit, Berkeley, and Chicago, new working groups and bureau bureaus were set up to study social issues through applied social sciences. With help of the Ford and Rockefeller Foundation, foundations there too, research units like Harvard's Department for Social Relations and Michigan's Survey Research Center arose in the post-war years. 
Having focused on the development of disciplines and methodologies in the early stages of the modern university, scholars now organized into thematic groups and aimed at solving social problems. Their main sponsors, philanthropic organizations like Rockefeller, Ford, and also Carnegie, encouraged them to tackle concrete social issues through interdisciplinary research. But the scholars themselves themselves had also been long interested in community studies. From the early 1920s, they had set up special projects of urban research inspired by the Chicago School of Sociology and supported by the Social Science Research Council, which also started in Chicago. Columbia University's Bureau of Applied Social Research, for example, investigated in the 1950s why ministers in the New York suburbs lost their grip on new generations of congregants. Similarly, the University of Michigan Survey Research Center investigated family planning in Detroit. The campuses, therefore, became directly involved in the communities that surrounded them. Uh, Clark Kerr was a fervent advocate of this purpose of the research university. He stated that, quote, an almost ideal location for a modern university is to be sandwiched between a middle class district on its way to becoming a slum and an ultra modern industrial park so that the students may live in the one and the faculty consult in the other, end quote. Kirk mentioned MIT in Cambridge, the suburb of Boston, and you see it here, as an example to other institutions. It was, quote, happily ensconced between the decaying sections of Cambridge, the Boston suburb, on the one hand, and Technology Square, on the other hand, end quote. So university campuses sandwiched between the area that needed improvement and the one that held the future. That was the ideal for administrators of the larger universities represented by Kerr. Another example is... Uh, students planning uh, the city, city planning for uh, San Francisco from Berkeley, University of California. Um, engaging deliberately with the state of democratic society, the American University created the circumstances that facilitated a new kind of research into Americans' political behavior. Increasingly, academics took an interest in the politics of the private sphere. And that is the focus of my dissertation. As I focus on the ways in which social scientists studied and articulated the informal obligations of American citizens, my research connects the history of higher education to that of cultural citizenship and American politics. It reveals how scholars monitored individuals in their private environments, such as the church, the home, and the work floor, using the latest survey methods, especially after World War II. As such, they assess the boundaries of the private spheres in which people perform their roles as responsible members of a greater national community. This new level of inquiry, focusing on emotions and behavior rather than economic motives for people's political choices, and opening up these people's private spheres for a study of politics, require their supportive intellectual environment. I argue that the philosophy or intellectual current behind the university's transformation was the same that inspired these new research projects. It entailed that universities engaged intensively with the general audience and that they attributed an unprecedented value to informal politics in Americans' daily interactions. Both of the, these characteristics in the American university were new in the middle of the 20th century and both facilitated scholarly research of political behavior in the private sphere of the citizen's life. The universities that made the strongest move towards engagement in society were also the ones with the most influential initiatives for the study of individual political behavior. Both at Clark Kerr's Berkeley and at Conan's Harvard, for example, labor relations were studied in a new way. The focus was not on the union versus business, but on the interactions between the individual worker and the manager. With salary and safety regu regulations mostly established after World War II, the subtle tactics of human resource resources officers 
and managers became important for the prospective increase of productivity. And there we should think about psychology, interacting with sociology and economics in order to improve efficiency of the workforce. Similar arguments were developed for power relations in the private spheres of the religious community, so ministers getting a grip on their congregation, or the family, parents, trying to control their children. Meanwhile, scholars gathering detailed information about the Americans' average behavior and urges could become influential spokespersons and advise the public. As such, universities became part of the American political culture that they had been studying. Scholars might even be considered informal political leaders. What I mean to say with, with this quick overview of my research is that academic influence is not only measurable in government policy, a theme much explored by World War, Cold War historians, but it's also measurable in the public debate and political culture. Uh, conclusion. Um, research at mid-20th century American universities came to appear increasingly relevant and applicable in Americans' daily lives and political negotiations. It could take on this new direction because of the policies of academic administrators and foundations, as well as intellectual cur currents and political events. So the foundation of the Ideopolis, or the city of intellect, which consisted of university institutions, administration, uh, was, as, was just as important as its scholars or the ideas that they generated. So in line with our conference team, theme, Clark Kerr's Ideopolis therefore touches upon both traditional intellectual history and the sociology of culture and intellectual professions. On this slide we see Berkeley, which is also an example of the Ideopolis. It overlooks San Francisco, and on the other side is uh, the poorer uh, area of Oakland, and uh, a lot of work could be done uh, by different bureaus of investigation uh, at Berkeley. Um, I want to say something about international comparison. I think, uh, although I am looking at the development of American universities, I think additional research would not be far removed in considering similar trends in European or maybe other uh, continental cases uh, about an overall, overall view of the university, its purpose, training, teaching, research. Um, in such comparative investigations, I see three important questions. The first would be, to what extent did European or other continent administrators think about the university as instrumental or in in integral to society? Uh, second, if they did think about it that way, to what extent was an informed democratic citizenship considered a main goal for education? <coughs> How heavy did that weigh in, in debates about the purpose of education? And in other words, uh, did European administrators uh, have that same zeal for the democratic education of the public as the American colleagues that I just uh, described? Uh, as a sub-question, did a certain kind of optimism about the malleability of minds and communities, which has been considered typical of United States culture, very uh, engineering, optimistic about changing society. Did this also drive the development of academia in other countries? The last question would consider the consequences of the university's development in the two continents. In terms of disciplines, I think the influence of European and American scholarship on each other has been investigated when we look at methods and theories and how they crossed the Atlantic. Um, I would be interested in finding what kind of influence research agendas or topics in the American social sciences had on European social science and vice versa. Um, the topics of social science development and cultural citizenship, although they seem far apart, uh, in my opinion lend themselves for an international or transnational approach. I've been very interested in hearing about the ways in which equivalence to the American ideopolis developed in other nations during the past century, and I hope to hear more about that tomorrow again. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for your fascinating paper, uh, which has given us uh, an overview of uh, the evolution of the American university model. Uh, we are very interested to know better and to understand better. Uh, 